thinking that uh, there probably has not been anything more universally panned or disliked than the year 2020. Um, I, I, di- I didn't, haven't talked to anybody that's like, you know, what a great year this has been, and I just wish it could last longer. Um, and yet we're going into a new year. And I think in this year, we really understand that we don't know what to expect. We have hope for a vaccine. We have hope that things can return to some semblance of what we view as normal, whatever that is. But there's so many things that we don't know about the coming year. And I wanted to preach today in this first Sunday of 2021 and kind of talk about what I think the role of the church should be, and specifically Belmar Church in the coming year. Because in in our society, I think we live in a world increasingly where people have less uh, priority and less place in their life for the church and for God. And yet, as we look around as believers, there's, there's never been a time in my lifetime where I think the world needs the church more and needs the Lord more. And so I think we need to know how to react to that. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, and I want to begin here this morning, is giving his Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says that he went up into a, a, a hillside, he sat down, and he began to teach. And he, he, in verse number 10, said this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I don't say that the church is under persecution in America today. There are people that would say that. But I think when you look at what Christians have endured historically, it might be a little presumptuous for us to say we're being persecuted. Nobody's breaking into our homes and dragging us out into the streets and beating us or or killing us for the sake of the gospel. And yet there is some opposition, or at at best, just uh, the ignoring of the church. And so I think we need to understand what our role needs to be as, as believers, as a group of Christians. And the first thing that I think we, I want to give you three things this morning that I think we need to do as Christians. And the first is what God did for us. We need to be people of love. We need to be people of love. Everything, and we're gonna end by talking about contending for the faith, by by talking about uh, 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 fighting or wrestling for the faith. But we need to start with this idea of love. That everything we do and say needs to be bound in love. Jesus said this in Matthew 22. He's, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. When asked what the most important thing was, Jesus didn't say, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. He said, love God. And then he said, and the second is like it or is like the first You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus linked together the loving of God with the loving of others. Because you can't love God and then hate other people. You can't love God but then just trash others. And they'd say, but I love God. Jesus connected these two. If you're going to love God, that love is going to spread to others as well. It's not strictly your relationship with God and nobody else. Loving others is connected to our love for God. So think with me for a moment 
about the person that you love the least. I spent four hours in, in mountain traffic yesterday afternoon. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a perfect driver. I recognize that. I'm better than average, but I'm not <laughs> based on my own subjective criteria. But there's certain cars that just irritate me. The out-of-state license plate. I'm being honest. This is church. I'm trying to be honest. I'm not saying it's right. And also the red fleet license plate that I'm pretty sure is a rental car. And then that person that rides in the left lane at like five miles an hour below the speed limit, just enjoying themselves. That's not joyful for me when I'm behind them. And I use that as a joke, although we can get pretty fired up in traffic. But there are some people or groups of people that if we're not careful, we can objectify and treat with less than love. Maybe it's people with different politically, political ideologies. Maybe it's people with lifestyles that are diametrically opposed to ours. Maybe it's people in other countries doing horrible and evil things. But we can begin to develop and begin to allow to take place in our heart an attitude that is unloving. And Jesus spoke directly about this type of thing. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, it says this, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This guy asks a question and says, what should I, what do I have to do to make sure that I'm going to spend eternity with God Almighty in heaven? And Jesus said, rather than giving him an answer, he said, well, I don't know. What do you read in the scriptures? What do you think? And he, he repeats to Jesus what Jesus had, had in, 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 a, in another teaching, it said, is the greatest commandment and the second like to it. He says, you've got to love God with all your heart, everything that you've had, everything that you have, and you have to love your neighbor as yourself. And listen to what Jesus said. You have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. Jesus didn't say, yeah, but you need to do something else. He said, you got it. Now, we understand that that's not the core of salvation. That's not what I'm telling you today. Right, the core of salvation is to repent of the wrong things that you've done before Jesus Christ and put your faith in him to receive God's grace. But the living out of that salvation is to love God and to love your neighbor. But the discourse doesn't stop. And you know the story. Verse 29, the lawyer he wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who's my neighbor? Jesus said, you got it right. And he goes, okay, but I mean, who's my neighbor? I mean, my house is great because I don't have a neighbor to my right. I only have one next door neighbor. So my standard's lower than, than someone that's got Two neighbors, a neighbor on each side, right? Some of you are like, man, I live out in the country. I have no neighbors. This is great. Some of you, you live in an apartment. You got above, below, beside. But in response to the man wanting to justify himself, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. That a Jewish man was attacked and beaten and left for dead, robbed, stripped of all that he had. 
And the priest and the Levite passed on the other side. But the Samaritan, the one who had no dealings with the Jews, the ones the Jews despised for perverting their worship and religion. They worship, they claim to worship Jehovah God, but they didn't worship him the right way. They didn't worship him in the right place. And they weren't fully Jewish. And the Samaritans knew that the Jews felt that way about them. That guy came and bandaged and carried to the end and cared for and provided out of his own funds. And Jesus, in verse number 36, said, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who met, fell among the thieves? I mean, to the Jew, a, a, a priest is going to be a much closer relationship. A Levite was, was a, a worker in the temple. These were Jewish men like this guy. These were religious leaders. They, they should have been the ones. Certainly not the Pharisee. That was a, a, quite a distant relationship and not a good one. But in the story that Jesus told, the man had to say, he who showed mercy on him, and then Jesus said, go and do likewise. If we're going to love as we're supposed to love as a church, it means we're going to love the people that we don't like. It means we're going to love the people who whose lifestyle or whose rhetoric is offensive to us. That's love. That's what the Samaritan did to the Jewish man. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. And to love is not just to say that we love, it's to show that we love. It's to put that love in action. Because that's what God did for us. That's what God illustrated for us when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, and that's what God did for us when he sent Jesus Christ. Luke chapter, or excuse me, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then he says this in verse 9, In this... The love of God was manifest or made known toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. You realize that God didn't look down on us as sinners and go, man, I love them. I hope they can figure out a way to be holy and, and then I could have a relationship with them. That's not what God did. God didn't look down on us as sinners and say, you know, I really love them if they would just get their act together and they would beg me enough, I could probably do something to help them out. No, the Bible says when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that none of us can get to God, that none of us seek after God, but God loved us, so he sent Jesus Christ to us. Go and do likewise. As a church, we can't just say we care about people. We can't just say we, we want our city to be better. We've got to put our, our love in action. We have to love, and then we've got to put it in action. We can't just be like, well, we love everybody. Maybe we ought to put it out on the sign. We love everybody, and then people will know. You know how people are going to know? When we show them. We've got to love. Not only that, we've got to speak up. Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse 13 says this, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. He is describing here a mature Christian. This guy knows what he believes. 
They're not tossed to and fro. They are, they've come to a full knowledge uh, of, of the gospel. And then it says this in verse number 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. We have this balance of truth and love. See, truth can be offensive. You ever had someone go, you know, how do I look in this? I've never had that. I mean, I have. But every time my wife's asked that, she's looked awesome. But some of you know what I'm talking about. Or, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be your, your, your wife or significant. You can just be a buddy. Hey, man, I got this new thing. What do you think? Well, maybe you don't want to tell them everything that you think. But we have to speak the truth. We, we as followers of Jesus Christ, as, as people who have the scriptures and who are supposed to live their lives by the scriptures, we have the truth. And we've got to share the truth. But we don't share the truth to condemn others. We're to share the truth in love. And so we don't want to water down the truth because that's not the truth. But we also don't want to share the truth without love. A mature Christian speaks the truth in love. And we're commanded to be ready to speak. First Peter chapter three and verse 15 says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. I'm just gonna be honest with you. You know who we don't need speaking for us as followers of Jesus Christ? Most national religious leaders that find their way on television. Now, I'm not, I, I don't want to condemn everybody, but I don't know how they figure out who to put on news shows and interview shows to represent what Christians think, but a lot of them are, to use a, a, a theological term, whack jobs. <laughs> and you know what? Those aren't the people I want speaking for me. So if we have the truth and we need to share it in love, then we've got to speak up. And I'm not saying you've got to find your way on television. You might just have an audience with one other person at your work or your neighbor across the fence. But we need to speak the truth. Because here's the other thing. I think a lot of times as Christians, especially if you've been a believer for any length of time, you assume that other people know what the truth is. Or you assume that other people know what a Christian would believe or think about certain situations. But I don't believe that that's not true. And all you have to do is turn on the TV, look at the news, look at different things, and you'll see that people will purport things about Christians that aren't true. People will say about Christians that they hate people who have lifestyles that we would view as being sinful. They'll say, well, Christians hate homosexuals. That's not true. That shouldn't be true of a, of a true follower of Jesus Christ. We're to love them. Isn't that what scripture, isn't that what the verses that we just read said? And so we, sh we shouldn't hate those people. Well, Christians, what, whatever the lie is, well, how are we gonna get the truth out there? That's our job. We have to speak up. We have to speak the truth in love. We can't assume and we should not allow other people to speak for us. 
We shouldn't allow some famous preacher on TV to be the word about what Christians believe because to be honest, half the time, that I don't agree with those things. I'm not going to name them, but anyway. By keeping silent, we do ourselves a disservice and we make a choice. Remember when Joshua stood before the people? Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 14. He said, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then he says this, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua stood up before the people and he said, look, you got to decide. You got to make a decision. And I believe in our society today, now more than other, ever, it's not enough just to kind of go with the flow. Listen, you're gonna be a part of conversations and different situations where you will either speak up for what the truth is or by being silent, you passively say, yes, I agree with this too. And again, I'm not talking about, we're gonna talk about contending for the faith as we close out this message this morning, but I'm not talking about being contentious. Everything ought to be done in love. But if we really love, we're going to speak the truth. I love my children. I love the three kids that God has given to me. But I don't wanna lie to them. You know, I tell them things like, listen, I, I, you've got great potential and, and you can do these things. But there's been times where my kids have, have talked about doing some things and I'm like, yeah, you, you, yeah you're not going to be able to do that. You, you just, l- let's have a reality check here. For whatever reason, their ability, our resources, whatever. Because if I really love somebody, I'm going to be honest with them. I'm not going to lie to them. If we really care about our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family, then we need, if we really care for them, if we love them, we need to speak the truth. But it all needs to be wrapped in love. And finally, we do need to contend. We need to engage. That word contend means to struggle for. Jude chapter one and verse three says this, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you or encouraging you, building you up to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. He said, listen, you've got to struggle for the faith. We need to speak up. We need to to struggle for, to fight for what is right. We need to proclaim the truth in our our jobs, in in our community, in our homes, and certainly within the church. But it's got, it's got to start in our homes. But we need to understand a couple of things first. Number one, we're empowered to contend. We're empowered to contend. First John chapter four and verse four says this, you are of God little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Listen, we're not talking about, well, of my own wit, of my own knowledge, of my own wisdom. We're empowered by God. That's why when Jesus Christ addressed his followers, uh, both in Acts chapter 1 and in Matthew chapter 28, where he, he commissions them to go out, he says, all power is given to me, go therefore. Listen, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, go and, and proclaim the truth. 
because we do so in supernatural power. And frankly, we need it. Amen? We need it. We need it to overcome fears that we have. We need it to overcome our own inadequacies. We need supernatural power, but we are promised it. And so we're not talking about, uh, you know, when we stand up for the truth, when we say, well, no, this is what I believe, or let me tell you what God's word says. We, we ought not to do it, and we're not going to be successful if we do it in our own power. I was thinking about that this week it, with the idea of preaching. If I'm not careful, you know what I can think? And, and you guys are going to find this hilarious because most of you have heard me preach on multiple occasions. But if I'm not careful, I can think, I've done this for a while. I think I know what I'm doing. You can laugh now. But you know what I just, I, I spent some time thinking about and praying about this week is, I don't want to preach based on my own wisdom or wit. What's that going to accomplish? I want my preaching to be empowered through the Holy Spirit because that's the type of preaching that's going to have an effect. That's the type of preaching that's going to make a difference in people's lives. And it's not just preaching that the preacher does. It's any time we have a conversation that, that, that God is at work because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And here's the other thing we need to understand. Not just that we are empowered for this struggle, but who we struggle against. In in Ephesians chapter six, verse number 10, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Think about that phrase right there for a moment. Who do we not wrestle against? Flesh and blood. Well, what's flesh and blood? It's people. When we talk about contending for the faith, we're not, and we talk about struggling, when we talk about a, a, a battle or a fight, we are not fighting people. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. That's not who the enemy is. That's not who we're fighting against. We need to remember that. Because as Christians sometimes, we forget and we, we identify another person as the enemy. A, another person is not our enemy. Listen, if I see another person and, and I think, and they're saying things that are contrary to the word of God, and they're living a lifestyle that is contrary to the word of God, we need to understand that that person is the object of God's love and God desires to redeem them and bring them to himself. That person is not the enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You might look at someone and think, well, that person's the embodiment of evil and wickedness. Haven't I done things that are evil and wicked? Haven't you? Haven't we been used by the enemy to do things that we ought not to do? And that is all that that person is in that position. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That changes, uh, that, that helps us be able to speak the truth in love. Listen, People are not our enemies. We might be opposed to them in so many ways, but God loves them and we're to love them. That's not who we're contending with. That's not who we're wrestling with. So how do we contend? Just a couple of things as we close. Number one, and I mentioned this earlier, it's got to start at home. Psalm 78 verse five says this, 
For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our father that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may... uh, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Listen, I, have, I had the great privilege of growing up in a home where my mom and dad loved me and loved the Lord. They took me to church and they instructed me in the ways of God and I appreciate that. I recognize that not everybody has that opportunity. But with that is a responsibility. Listen, I don't want my kids to attain to the spiritual level of their mother and father. My goal for my children is that they would walk closer to Christ than I do. That they would love him more than I do. That they would serve him with a greater commitment than I do. That's what I want for my kids. And that needs to be the priority of my instruction for my kids. Listen, I want my kids to to find happiness and fulfillment in their career. And I want my kids to have relationships that that have great meaning for them. And, And but you know what? My greatest priority for my children is that they would love and follow Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because all of those other things can can be predicated on that thing. I'm not saying if, if they follow Christ, everything will be perfect. It undoubtedly will not. I'm not saying if they follow Christ, then they're gonna be wildly successful in their career and have great financial success. They 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 may not, but I would rather have a child who loves the Lord and genuinely seeks to follow after them, after him, than one who's wildly successful career-wise or financial. It's got to be a priority in our homes. It's also got to be a priority. We've got to contend in our churches. Ephesians 5 and verse 25 says this, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus Christ died for the church. Now, I don't believe that being a pastor or a preacher is any higher of a calling than any other vocation. I really, I don't think that. God gifted us individually. Matter of fact, God says he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and the weak things of this world to confound the strong. Ta-da! Right? I mean, that's... (laughs) Listen, it... (laughs) Yeah. But I do have one great advantage as a pastor, I think, is I work for the institution to which Christ gave his life. But here's the good news. That's the church, and you know what the church is? It's us. It's not, it's not an institution. It's a gathering of people. The church is powerful. The, 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 the church It is divinely created and appointed as the mechanism to be a light in this world. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16. Simon Peter uh, was the first to jump in when Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? And Peter said this in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You realize what Jesus said there? He said, hell cannot defend itself against the church. Think about that for a moment. 
Because he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. He said whatever you agree upon in this world, it will be agreed upon in heaven. Whatever you loose will be loose. Whatever you bind will be bound up. What if a group of people began to agree and pray and love and work to see their friends and family, their neighbors and their co-workers come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior? What if a group of people begin to agree together to be a light in their community? That is what God has called us to do as the church. We need to be renewed in our vision of what God has for us as a group of people. We are to contend for for the faith, to struggle for it not against flesh and blood, but against the enemy. But Jesus himself said, but the gates of hell won't prevail. Together, as a church, God has equipped us to do great things. Together, as a church, God has equipped us to do great things. Together as a church, God has equipped us to do impactful things in this community. Together as a church, God has equipped us to do powerful things that I believe can affect this state and and even this country. And you might look around and go, this church? What's so great about Belmar Church? What's so great is Jesus Christ loved it and gave himself for it. And he said, I will build it and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Finally, we need to engage our culture. Acts chapter one, beginning in verse seven, Jesus Christ is commissioning his followers right before he ascends into heaven. And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And we talked about this a little bit last week that I don't think those disciples had any idea how far they were gonna travel for the cause of Christ. I don't think they had any idea how impactful the message of the gospel was gonna be for the cause of Jesus Christ. But Jesus commissioned them to go. You realize right here in this room may be someone that God calls to to proclaim the gospel to a different country. You realize over in the next building where the children are meeting may be the next pastor of Belmar Church or, or the next missionary or minister to do some great thing. God has given us the church. He's empowered us, and we've got to go and engage the world in which we live. Here's the thing, and I'm gonna close with this. You may be here this morning, you think, well, preacher, I've got a lot of limitations. Listen, the my job is such, or my, my, my living circumstance is such. God doesn't care where you are as much as he cares who you are. And I love the story found in Acts chapter eight. We're gonna close with just a few verses there. Because in Acts chapter eight, we see a guy at work named Philip. They called him Philip the Evangelist. And Philip was up preaching and teaching And in Acts chapter uh, eight and verse 26, it says this. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then it says this, this is desert. 
Now, Philip was in the cities. He was preaching and people were coming to Christ. And then in verse 26, the Spirit directs him and says, go to the desert. He goes to the desert and there he encounters a guy. A man, an Ethiopian man, a man from Africa, a different continent, who had been to Jerusalem to worship, was returning to his home and he's reading out of Isaiah. But evidently in his trip to Jerusalem, he either had not encountered another believer in Jesus Christ or he had not understood the gospel message. But there he's reading from Isaiah and Philip joins himself to him and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. And Philip began to explain to him from that passage moving forward that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And finally, the man has the chariot stop and he says, here's water. What stops me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, and he said, I do. And they went down. And this man was baptized. And in verse 39, it says, now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Aztos and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Here's what I love about that story. Moving Philip was no big deal. He was in the cities, he had a ministry. God speaks to him and says, go to the desert. Philip goes, okay. He went to the desert for one guy, but that guy took, took Christ and the gospel with him to a whole other continent. And then when Philip was done, when God was done with Philip in the desert, it says he just caught him away. Now I'm not encouraging you to rely on that for your commute tomorrow. But I think it's illustrative of the fact that wherever you are, God desires to use you. You might say, well, preacher, I'm, I'm retired, or preacher, I'm just working this menial job, or preacher, I don't even have a job right now. Listen, God has a plan for you. You're part of the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Will you simply be willing to be used by him? Will you love God and love others? Will you speak up and speak the truth in love? Recognizing that flesh and blood is not our enemies, but there is an enemy out there, but greater who is in us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. This is what God has called us to do as a church, as a, as a body of believers. And I'm praying that we would pray and agree together to ask God to use Belmar Church in the coming year to do great things for the cause of Christ, right here in the city of Lakewood and around the world. Let's pray this morning. Dear God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. God, I just ask that you would take your word, that you would apply it, that you would build us up for your work. That as a church, God, we would see you move in us and use us for mighty things in the year to come. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.